Calvary Chapel Mission Viejo, welcome again to Online Church. Let's sing Before the Throne of God Above. Well, good morning. Welcome, Calvary Chapel, Mission Viejo. Glad you are watching online today. You know, one of the promises of the Bible, one of the statements that the Bible gives us with regard to who God is, that he never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, which really is amazing. I mean, if that statement applies to me, that's not a good thing because I'm, I am not perfect. I am not perfectly good or infinitely loving, but those apply to God, and he never changes and with so many things swirling around us in our day and age isn't it comforting to know that he never changes and he stays infinitely perfectly good and loving would you join me in prayer as we begin so father thank you for the fact that you are a constant and not only that a constant good and a constant lover constantly desiring what is best for us and leading us inviting us more fully into love and life with you. So we thank you for that and pray that as we navigate this day, this service, that you would again anchor us deeply in that. That as we come with maybe cares and concerns, that we would find rest. Rest in you, rest in Jesus, and rest in the life that you offer. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple things to mention just by way of announcement. September 23rd, take notice uh, of this. We are having a couple cyber safety webinars. At 5.30, there's going to be a webinar that is specifically for parents, grandparents, and those caring for children. Uh, such an important issue in our day and age when kids, grandkids are spending increasing amount of time on the Internet. 
in certain things that we should be aware of. And then right after that, at 7.30, there's going to be another webinar for students who are middle school or high school. Both of those are available. You can contact Amy Reyes, amy at cmvchurch.com, and she will give you more information. Also, next weekend, September 18th through 20th, is our annual church camp out down near San Clemente. There are still a couple spots available. If you are interested in those, contact Neil or Nancy Travisano. And uh, again, a reminder that uh, next month, October, we're going to be moving worship services back indoors here. Uh, the state is... Um, um, loosened up some, some regulations or restrictions with regard to uh, churches, so we'll be moving indoors in October. We will, though, have a very large monitor outside for people who feel more comfortable or need to be in an outside environment, so you can watch the service live, and in addition, you will be able to watch it online. So um, plenty of options come October. And again, thank you for your consistent giving. We appreciate it. Uh, again, you can uh, mail a check to the office or you can give online or through the app. Our missionary today is Camp Allendale. This is a ministry that we've supported for a number of years. They have a camp facility up in the local mountains near Big Bear, and they provide camping opportunities for those in uh, young people who are in foster situations. So really ministering to kids who are um, needy, relationally, and in many ways struggling. Uh, this past summer they had camps, but all the camps were virtual uh, because they were not able to have campers there in person. Uh, affected them, but to their credit, they leaned into what they could, and they provided some great opportunities for kids. So we want to pray for them uh, financially, that despite uh, some of the restrictions, that the God would provide for them in amazing ways, but also that these seeds that were sown this summer would continue to uh, continue to bear fruit. So would you join me in prayer for our offering today and for Camp Allendale? Lord, we do thank you that um, thank you that you are not hindered in any way, even when there's restrictions in the human realm. Your word uh, is never stopped. Thank you that that was true with Camp Allendale this summer, that even though they could not host students up at their camp facility, uh, that uh, the staff there went to great lengths to interact with kids, to connect with kids, and to speak to, preach to kids. So we pray that all that transpired uh, this summer would continue to bear fruit in the lives of these kids, that the things that they experienced, the things that they heard would continue to root deeply in their hearts and lead some of these kids, many of these kids, Lord, we pray, to life and freedom and fullness in Christ. Pray for Tyler and his wife as they give leadership to Allendale, that you would strengthen them in grace, that you would provide for that ministry in amazing ways ways to have your fingerprints all over it. So bless that ministry and build that ministry, transform lives through that ministry, Lord, we pray. And we thank you for this service and uh, even for the opportunity to give back uh, even a small portion of what you have entrusted to us. I pray that we would do this with gladness and in great dependence and fully trusting you to provide for all of our needs individually and as a church. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. What joy is found in communion with you Beholding your beauty and knowing your truth Your heart Responding with
Well, welcome Calvary Chapel family. So good to be with you again here online. So grateful for those of you that were here last Sunday outside. Man, it was a scorcher. It was hot. It was really hot, but man, it was good to see so many people. Good to just fellowship with one another, be together as the church. Let me start in prayer as we pray for the word of God. Father, I thank you for the blessing of being together this morning. May you bless the teaching of your word. May you open our hearts to what you have for us this morning as we look at the book of Ephesians and the teaching of Paul. And we pray this in Jesus' name. You know, as we're beginning to meet again every Sunday, I thought it would be important for us as a church to talk about why church is so vital. Why is it vital to our spiritual health? So over the next several weeks, we will be looking and focusing on the importance and teaching of the church. Now, if I was to ask you, what is the church? What would you say? Now, some people might say that that church is the building that we meet in. You know, it's a place to go to meet people. It's a place to have my social needs met. Others might say that church is a place that you go to get something. You know, you go to church to get spiritual nourishment. You go to church to to get taught the word of God. You go to church to, to get worship. It's a place almost like going to a theater where you go to, but it has a spiritual emphasis. You go, you you find a seat, you listen to the message. Of course, you have to rate the message depending on how you like it. Then afterwards, maybe you talk to a few people, you go home, mission accomplished. Well, there might be others who look at the church maybe more as a, a social institution. It's a place that people go to help the needy and the poor. It's a place where, come, where people come to have their practical needs met. I mean, there's so many opinions, so much mis- misunderstanding. But today, I want to focus on what the Bible says. Because the Bible is God's word. And in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul the Apostle will give us three important insights about the church. So what is the church? The first insight that Paul gives us is the church is a people, not an organization or a building. Church is is about people, the people of God, that God has brought together and he has made them into one. Wayne Grudem, who is a theologian, said that the church is the community of all true believers for all time. Let me read to you Ephesians chapter two, verses one through five. Now we're gonna work through the first 12 verses here, but I'm gonna start with those first five. Ephesians chapter two, starting in verse one says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We're by nature, we, we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So the church is not this building. It's not some social club that you join. It's not some kind of an organization. The church is made up of different people that have been born again, transformed, changed by the work of the Holy Spirit that are now alive in Christ. And the word church in the Greek is the Greek word ekklesia. Now this is, translates from the Hebrew word qual, which refers to people who are called out or assembled by God as his special possession. One writer said this about the church. He said the church is the whole body of of the faithful who have been or or shall be spiritually united to Christ as their Savior. So the church is people who have received Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, and they have been changed and transformed. Now Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 who we were before we were part of God's church. He says this, in verse one, he says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, how are we to understand human nature? That is the natural man. Well, there's really only three ways to look at it. 
if you might, might say, three views. The first view is that all people are basically good. I mean, mankind is just basically good. Now, we're not as good as we could be because we're in a state of evolving. Just like the world is evolving, people are, are evolving. Yes, we've done bad things, but we're getting better. Basically, we're good. The second view is that people are basically sick, that we need help from God. We're not well. Now, we, we, we do bad things. We're, we're spiritually sick. We need help from God. But God is a God of love, and God will look at our good things over the bad things. So basically, we're okay, but we need God to help us some. That's the second view. The third view is the biblical view that we have here from Paul. And Paul teaches that everyone, every person, is born spiritually dead. Now, the Bible agrees mankind is not well, but the way the Bible explains it, it's much more serious diagnosis than just six. Every person is born spiritually dead. We're dead in our relationship to God. We are separated from God. And this death that it speaks about here is what God warned Adam about in the garden in Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, it says that the Lord commanded man, saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you shall surely die. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God and they ate that forbidden fruit, curse came upon man. Adam and Eve experienced two deaths. They experienced both a spiritual death and also they experienced physical death. Their spiritual death happened. God expelled them from the garden. God separated himself from them. And then the second death, their physical death, happened a little later. And every person ever born after Adam and Eve had inherited both these deaths. Warren Wiersbe said this, he said, like a spiritual corpse, a sinner, a person without Christ is unable to make a single move toward God on their own or even respond to God. And so the Bible is very clear. The unbeliever, those without, without Christ, are not just sick, they are dead spiritually. We do not need recitation, resuscitation. What we need is a resurrection. We need to be brought to life spiritually by God. So all lost sinners are dead. And apart from the grace of God, it is hopeless for mankind. This is why Romans 1.18 says this, that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. As an unbeliever, I suppressed the truth in my unrighteous sin. And since Adam, sin has permeated to the very core of mankind. Now Paul explains what this sin nature looks like in Ephesians chapter two, verse three. He says, among them we too formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So what Paul is saying here is that, that a sinner is depraved, that the sinner lives to please his own desires of the flesh and the, the lustful desires of the mind. Now, I'm not saying that an unbeliever cannot be kind to people and do good things for people, but what I am saying is that a sinner cannot merit salvation on their own. The lost sinner is doomed this is what John said in John 3.18. He said, they are condemned already. Man cannot save himself. So the attributes of an unbeliever we see in verses 2 and 3. In verse 2, we walk according to the course of this world. That means we live like every other sinner. Verse 3 says, we, we live in the lust of our flesh. We live with these sinful desires that dom, dominate us and they impact our decisions and our actions. We were far from God, but praise God, God didn't leave us that way. That was us in the past. We were without Christ. But then when you look at the text, now God moves in by his grace. 
Look at verses four and five of Ephesians two. It says, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Man, two words, but God. What a difference those two words make. Church is about people. It's about a people that were dead in their transgressions and sins, but now God has made them alive together in Christ. Now, how does this happen? Well, Paul tells us here in verse four that God is a God who loves us. And because of, great, because of God's great love, he then reached out to us in that love. He reached out to us through Christ and he offers us love and his forgiveness found in his son. We do not deserve it. We cannot earn it. But it is God who makes that first move towards us in love. And how does he do this? Well, first, he offers us mercy. Mercy means not getting what you deserve. As a sinner by nature, you deserve judgment. You deserve the wrath of God. But God instead, he offers us what we see in verse five. He offers us his grace. Grace and mercy are the flip sides of the same coin. He doesn't give us what we deserve, mercy, but he does reach out to us with unmerited favor, grace. We don't deserve it. But God in love reached out to us and he extends to us grace. Now Paul expounds what this looks like in verses six through seven. He said, and raised us up with him and he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. In Christ, we have been freed from the shackles of sins. Sin enslaved us. But in Christ, when we believed in Christ, when we responded in faith, we were freed from the shackles of sin. John Stott put it like this. He said, these two monosyllables, but God, set against the desperate condition of fallen mankind, the gracious initiative and sovereign action of God. We were the objects of his wrath, but God, out of the great love for us, had mercy upon us. We were dead, and dead men do not rise, but God made us alive with Christ. God has taken action to reverse the condition of our sin. And he did this all by grace. It is by grace that you have been saved. This is why Paul says in verses eight and nine, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God and not a result of works so that no one can boast. Salvation is offered freely as a gift. And God is calling us by his grace to respond to this gift of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus came and he lived the perfect life we cannot live. And then he died on the cross. And then he was buried. And then he rose from the grave. And we are called to respond to that great gift by faith. And when we repent and believe in Christ, spiritual change takes place. We are transformed from who we were, sinners by nature, into now being part of God's church part of his family. And when we believe in Christ, we're also given spiritual gifts. God has created works for us to do, and this is what he says also in verse 10. He says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we would walk in them. As Christians, you and I have a purpose. As Christians, we have been created by God to serve him and to know him. Without Christ, guys, absolutely hopeless. But in Christ, great hope. And what Paul does is he finishes this section in verse 12, kind of highlighting again who we were, how bad things were. In verse 12, he says, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ. You were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, Paul here, he's focusing on the Jewish believers. See, to the, to the Jews, they knew that they were God's people. 
And the Gentiles, they, they understood that they were not known as the people of God. And so Paul here, he's calling to the Gentiles to remember who they were before they came to know Christ. They were pagans and they were not God's people. They were strangers to the covenants. They were separated from Christ. They had no hope and they were without God in the world. But in verses four through 10, we see, we see who we are now in Christ. We've been shown love and we've been shown mercy. We've been made alive together with Christ. We have a secure future. We've been raised up with him in the heavenly places. And we have been saved. We have been rescued by God's grace. And now we have a job to do, a purpose that have been created for us in him. Now, as a way of illustration, I have this bowl of grapes sitting right here. Now, these grapes represent who we are in Christ. When you look at the fruit of the grape, this can represent the works or the service that we do for Christ. And if you notice, each grape is maybe a little different size, a little different shape. We're all unique in the kingdom of God. And so the, the fruit of the grape represents the, the works that we do. And then the stems that connect that fruit are really just who we are. We are people of God and we are connected to the vine. And the vine represents Christ. We are the fruit of his labor, and that labor happened on the cross. We were adopted into his kingdom, part of the family of God, known as the church. And as long as we remain abiding in Christ, we will thrive and will continue to produce fruit. But if we pull away from Christ, if we don't know Christ and seek Christ and live for Christ, we'll be kind of like what happens to fruit when it separates from the vine will be like the raisins that many of our kids love to eat. Our faith will become small. Our hope will shrivel. And we will become weak. But in Christ, we're strong. And in Christ, we're part of his church. So that first insight that we see this morning from Ephesians 1 through 12 is that the church is a people. It's not an organization or a building. The second insight is that the church is a divine creation. It's not a human invention. Just as the conversion of a sinner is the work of God, so is the people of God coming together, being united as one in Christ. Now, I'm going to be looking at verses 13 through 18, but I want to look at the first three verses, 13 through 15. Let me read that. It says, But now in Christ Jesus you formerly were far off and have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier, the dividing wall. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of the commandments contained in the ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Now when you hear people talk about the church, Many people will talk about it as kind of a voluntary organization, you know, where people choose whether or not they're going to be a part of it, kind of like they would choose whether or not they're going to be part of a club. But when the Bible speaks about the church, it speaks about its origin as coming from God. The church is a divine creation. But the church, it has its roots in the Old Testament, and it cannot be understood without understanding that Old Testament background. Now, again, that, that word church in the Greek is ekklesia, and it translates from the Hebrew word qual, which refers to a people who are called out by God as his special possession. And the idea is a called out people, people who belong to God. And we know that, that in the, the Old Testament and in the New Testament, there are people who are called out to God. In the Old Testament, the called out people were the people of Israel. And it started with Abraham. Abraham was called out by God and he was promised by God that he would make him into a great nation and that one day his ancestors would possess that land. And Abraham's response to God is that he believed by faith and he worshiped God. And we see the same thing and the same pattern in dealing with Abraham's son, Isaac, and also with his grandson, Jacob. Now, Jacob led the people of Israel to the, to the land of Egypt, and they were enslaved there, and there they lived for 400 years, and then God called out a man by the name of Moses, 
And he was to free the people from that land and he was to take them to the promised land, it tells us in Exodus chapter three. Finally, there was also a call and a promise given to the people of Israel from their Babylonian captivity. And they were taken out of captivity and brought back to the land, it tells us in Jeremiah 16. Now the church is also made up of people who are called out by God. The church is founded in our Lord Jesus Christ and his people are called out by the work of the Holy Spirit. But the church is made up of people of every nationality, every kind of race. The church has its beginnings in Acts chapter two. It was on the day of Pentecost and God moved in power of the Holy Spirit and he came upon the disciples and he filled the disciples and when he did, they began to speak in tongues and the people in Jerusalem that heard him speaking in tongues thought that maybe they were drunk. And so Peter, he stood up and in Acts chapter two, he preached his first sermon. And Peter said this in Acts chapter two, verse 14. It says, but Peter taking his, his stand with the 11, he raised his voice and he declared to them, men of Judea and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. And then he preached a sermon to them about Jesus Christ being the Messiah and that they must repent. And when the people heard this, Acts chapter two, verse 37 says that they were pierced to the heart and then Peter said, and the rest of the, they said this to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what must we do? And Peter told them that they must repent and receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, Lord, and they did. And that very day, 3,000 souls were added to the church so the, the church was established by God in one day. It went from just a few disciples to over 3,000 people. Now Paul had said in Ephesians chapter two, verse 12, who we were before we knew Christ. He said we were far off from God. We were strangers and separated from God. We were without hope and without God. But here in verse 13, he says, but now in Christ. Again, what incredible words, but now in Christ. He says, now in Christ we have great hope because we have been brought near to Christ by the blood of the Lamb, by the blood of Christ. Verse 15 says it's through the death and resurrection of Christ that Christ has established a new man, a new people group, now Paul is talking about being brought near to God as a result of Christ shedding his blood on the cross as an atonement for our sin. And he's also referring to God bringing together both the Jews and the Gentiles to form a whole new people group, one known as the church. Because before Christ, the Jews were known as the people of God and the Gentiles were considered far off from God, separate from God. That's because Gentiles were idol worshipers and they were cut off. But now in Christ, God has brought into his kingdom the Gentile. Those who were separated have been brought near. Now the early church started out just as being Jewish, only Jewish converts. But then God began to call out Gentiles. We see this began in Acts chapter eight. Saul of Tarsus, who we know became Paul the Apostle, he began to persecute the church in Jerusalem. And so God, by his spirit, started to move people out. But when they left, they went out preaching. And Philip, he went down to Samaria. And Philip preached to the Samaritans, and they believed. Now, the Samaritans were believed as half-breeds. They were, they were considered to be sinners. But also, at the end of Acts chapter 8, God called Philip to go on a desert road and he met an Ethiopian eunuch, a Gentile. And that Ethiopian eunuch, he believed and trusted in Christ and he was baptized that very day. Gentiles suddenly were being added to the church. Then in Acts chapter 10, God moved by his spirit on a man by the name of Cornelius. He was a Gentile Roman centurion, but he feared God. And God called him and told him to call Peter to come and share the truth of the gospel with him. 
And in Acts chapter 11, Peter was having a vision. And in this vision, Peter saw this great sheet. And on that sheet were all kinds of different animals. These animals were animals that the Jews were not supposed to eat. They were considered ceremonially unclean. But God, three different times in Acts chapter 11, verse 7, told him to kill and eat. Now, this vision that God showed Peter was telling him that the old covenant with Israel and its dietary laws and ceremonies had ended. A new covenant was being established, and Peter went to Cornelius. He preached the gospel, and Cornelius and his whole family believed, and they were added to the church that very day. God now has established a new covenant And this covenant is not based on the Mosaic law or ceremonial washings or religious sacraments. It is now based on faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. This is why Paul said in verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Verse 12, before Christ, Gentiles were foreigners and and they were apart from the covenants and the promises, but now in verse 13, Gentiles who believe have been brought near. They've been added to the church. This is why Paul said this in verses 14 and 15. He said, for he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, and he broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of the commandments contained in the ordinances, so that he himself might make the two into one man, thus establishing peace. Now, I think what Paul had in mind when he spoke about the dividing wall is the wall that surrounded the temple in Jerusalem. In Paul's day, you had the temple, and the temple was surrounded by four different courts, Each one got closer to the temple and particularly the Holy of Holies. The first courtyard was known as the court of the priest and it was the innermost court and it was closest to the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was and and the Spirit of God where he dwelt. In this courtyard, only men who were of the priesthood of the tribe of Levi, only they were allied in that courtyard. The second courtyard from that was known as the court of Israel. It could be entered by any male Jew, but no Jewish women would be allowed in that courtyard. The third courtyard was known as the court of the women. All Jews were allowed to go into this court, but it's called the court of the women because the women were not allowed to go past that point. And then you had the fourth and the last courtyard. But it was on a different level than those other three courtyards. And it was known as the court of the Gentiles. And to get to the court of the Gentiles, From the court of the women, you would have to go down five steps. And then there was a five-foot wall that went around the whole perimeter of where the temple was. And then you had to go down another 14 steps. And it was at that level that was the court of the Gentiles. It was totally separated by a wall and by space. This wall was a visible symbol of the enmity between the Jews and the Gentiles. One writer said this, he says, in all of ancient world, no wall was so impassable as the wall between the Jew and the Gentile. But now Paul writes in verses 14 and 15 that Jesus is our peace. And he now unites both the Jew and the Gentile into one. He has destroyed the barrier in the work of Christ. Jesus has established peace. First, Peace with God. We were estranged from God, but now he reconciles us to God. Then, peace with our fellow man. But that peace can only be established by the blood of Christ. And he reconciles them both on the cross. This is what he said in verse 16 of Ephesians 2. He says, and that they might be reconciled them both into one body of God through the cross by having put to, put to death the enmity. Now, enmity means hostility or hatred. The church is a divine institution that is created by God through Christ. 
bringing people together from every tongue, tribe, and nation. And whatever enmity there was, it has been destroyed and peace has been brought in because Christ himself establishes that peace. True peace can never be established outside of Christ. And it just makes me think today, there's so much division on so many fronts. People are divided politically, racially, morally, economically, religiously, but in Christ, peace is established. Is it established with God and is established with others that know him? Ultimately, mankind's greatest problem is with God himself. And this is where where Paul ends it here in verses 17 and 18. He says, and he came and he preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit and the Father. Jesus Christ preached peace. That peace is established through him. First with God, then with our fellow man. This is why Paul wrote that there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. So the church is not based on ethnic origin. No matter where you come from, you're welcome. The church is not based on economic status or station. Whether rich or poor, you're welcome. The church is not based on skin color, no matter your race. You're welcome. The church is not based on gender, whether you're a male or female. You're welcome. Jesus Christ is peace. He has broken down the dividing wall, and in him we become one. As a way of illustration, I was thinking again about the temple. You know, when Jesus was hung on that cross, and he was, towards the end, he said, it is finished. Understand that day, was Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur was when the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies and and he could make a sacrifice for the sins of Israel by sacrificing an unblemished lamb. And at the moment that that high priest was taking the life of that lamb, Jesus was breathing his last and saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And it was at that moment when Christ breathed his last, that in that very temple, that veil that covered the Holy of Holies, where that high priest stood, that veil was torn from top to bottom. And that veil represented the old covenant with Israel of of the sacrifices and its ceremonies. And it's a symbol that all that is abolished now. And now we have a new covenant. And this new covenant is in Christ. And those who believe in Christ now are his people. The old is gone and the new has come. And now we are God's people. And we are known as the church. And the church is part of his creation. Two insights that we've seen. The church is a people, not an organization or a building. The church is a divine creation, not a human institution. And last, the church is lived out corporately, not individually. The church is made up of individuals who are called by God to live out the Christian life together with others. Look at verses 19 through 22. It says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fit together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Now, when you look at the Bible, the Bible speaks about the church as a community of believers who corporately go through life and serve together. Followers of Christ are never to live out this life just individually, just you and Jesus against the world. We're not to be isolated. No, we're to be together. We're to be a community. We're to draw together as one in Christ. Now, Paul, what he does here is he lays out three images that speak about a church community, a kingdom, a family, and a temple. So Paul begins with a kingdom. He says, we are no longer 
strangers or aliens, but we are fellow citizens. We are saints of God's house. Israel has been a chosen nation. But as a chosen nation, they rejected the Redeemer that was sent to them in Jesus Christ. And when they rejected them, God chose another nation. Now, Jesus said this in Matthew 21, verse 43, to the religious leaders. He said, therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing fruit of it. That people that are fruit produ producing is the church. It is a nation of every tongue and every tribe. All believers, regardless of our national background, now become part of the nation of the kingdom of God. And this is what Jesus preached. He said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's Mark 1, verse 15. So the kingdom of God now is made up of people from every nation, every tongue, every tribe. Now, Peter even called God's people a nation. In 1 Peter 2, 9, he says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession. So we are a holy nation. We are part of the kingdom of God. Now, our culture is built around individuals, individualism. For many American Christians, they kind of approach church kind of like a consumer. Let me pick and choose what I want, what I can get, what will help me, the individual. But this is not how God views the church. God views the church that we are part of his kingdom, all of us. And not only that, Paul also says we're part of God's family. Also in verse 19, he says we're of God's household so through faith in Christ, we're added into the family of God's. You and I have brothers and sisters in the Lord. And together, God is our Father. Jesus is the head over the church. And we are part of this family, brothers and sisters in the Lord. And to become a member of any family, you either have to be born into it or you have to be adopted into it. And those same truths are part of the church. Jesus told Nicodemus that you must be born again if you're going to be part of the kingdom of God. And we also know that Paul the Apostle wrote in Romans 8, verses, verse 15, that we are adopted into God's family. Listen to what Paul said in Romans 8, 15. He says, for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading again to fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. In Christ, we have been born again spiritually and we've been adopted into God's family. And a healthy family, it, it supports and, and lives life together. And this is what the church is to do. We're to live life together as a community. And this is what Paul says in verse 20. He says, he says having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself, the cornerstone. Now, what Paul is doing is he's shifting from a kingdom to a family, and now he's looking at the temple. And when I think about the temple, it's made of many stones, and each of us are a stone making up that temple. But that temple sits upon a foundation. Now, the book of Genesis, God walked with his people. But in the book of Exodus, God decided to dwell with his people in the wilderness wanderings, he dwelt in a tabernacle. When they came into the promised land, he dwelt in the temple. But then they sinned against God and they rejected his Messiah and his spirit departed. But God came back in, in the life of Christ. But they rejected him as the redeemer. And so God no longer lives in temples made by man. Now he dwells in the hearts of men. And the foundation structure, he says, is of the apostles and the prophets. Guys, that is the word of God. That is the truth. The church rests on the truth of God's word. And the chief cornerstone is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the foundation. He binds the structure together. And we are called out to live this earthly existence as a community of God's people. We're part of his kingdom. We're members of his families. We ourselves have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us as the temple of God. You know, I have been so fortunate with my family to be a part of this church family. 
We've been part of this church since 1999. And some of you have walked with me through some of the most difficult parts of my life. When my dad passed away from a heart attack, when my brother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and died seven years later, some of you were with me through some of those toughest times. And I have laughed and had such good times with many of you over the years. And I've walked with many through you, through your difficult times. Guys, we're a family. And I am closer to some of you than even some of my own uh, siblings that I know. We're a family. Now, if you're part of this church and you don't view it that way, you can. Because God has designed the church that we're in it together as a community. God has designed the church that we do life together because that is his plan. That is his way. We are brought in from all different races, nationalities, and we've become one in Christ. We are God's church. Let's pray. Well, Father, I thank you for the word of God and I thank you for your kindness. I thank you for what, what Paul said here in the book of Ephesians. Thank you, Lord for how good you've been to us. Oh, you bring hope to the hopeless and to those in the darkness and to So the church is us, God's people. The church is a divine institution created by God for his glory. The church is about God's people living life together, sharing life together, serving the Lord together, reaching the lost together. Let's do this, brothers and sisters, in this season. I know things are a little squirrely right now, different because of the coronavirus. But we are in this together as God's family. So my prayer for you today is that the Lord will bless you and that he will keep you, that he will shine his face upon you and that he will give you his peace. Until we see each other next time, may the Lord be with you. God bless.